or an explicit disavowal of the categories coming out of this tradition of emancipation. Categories like class, categories like capitalism, like imperialism. The entire tradition, in fact, coming out of the socialist step being now described as an arm of imperialism, as an intrinsically Western set of categories. Well, they may be right. It might be true. But the burden of proof is on you to show that it's true. And the burden of proof is on you to show how it might have been that if these were all alien ideologies, tens, hundreds of millions of peasants of brown, black, and yellow skin, workers of brown, black, and yellow skin, rushed to political organizations espousing these ideologies. We are now back in an era in which an essential abiding and unbridgeable difference between cultures, between races, is seen as the linchpin of progressive or anti-racist politics. Well, this comes with a cost, it seems to me. And I would just like to lay out what some of these costs are. First of all, if your animating category, if your animating distinction for your critique of social domination is not people's material interests, the suppression of those interests, is not the social system that gives rise to that domination. But if your animating, critique, uh, animating categories are East versus West, or European versus indigenous, the first cost that, it comes, that comes with it is that it leads without, I don't think there's any way to avoid this, it leads to a celebration of what is the native, the internal, the indigenous, and a denigration of what are perceived to be sources of influence coming out of Europe or coming from the outside. But the problem is, who is authentically indigenous? Who are we going to say which ideologies have not been touched, have not been sullied by some influence coming out of Europe? And who is authentically Indian? Who's authentically African? Are the Jews who came to India 1,500 years, uh, sorry, 800 years ago, are they Indian? Are the Christians, the Syrian Christians who supposedly, legend has it, came to India in 60 AD, they're Christian, Does that make them Indian or no? Are the Muslims who have been living in India for a thousand years, can they be Indian? Unclear. This search for indigeneity leads inevitably, in my view, to an obsession with authenticity and a very quick discovery, either that such authenticity is not going to be found, that human civilizations have been intermingling and crossing over for centuries, indeed, for millennia, and you're not going to be able to find easily a distinction between what is Western and what is not, but also a form of authoritarianism, easily, in which one ethnicity one group of the indigenous is considered to be acceptable, others are not. A second cost that comes with that is that if you shift your attention from class domination, from exploitation, from patriarchal domination, simply to what is internal, which is to be valued, and external, which is to be uh, 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 criticized, it inevitably leads to a downplaying and a abandonment of the critique of domestic sources of domination. Because in the post-colonial world, make no mistake, those sources of domination, the forces that, uh, that are uh, implementing those, those, that kind of domination, quite often are going to be people of the same ethnicity and of the same racial background or uh, the, the, the same sort of um, ethnic background as the people who are at the bottom of that society. Therefore, it seems to me, there's no way in which you can abandon the categories that people like Cabral or people like Walter Rodney, Rodney died as a leading figure in the Guyanese Workers' Party. There's no way to abandon that particular framework, which then leads finally to the worry that in the wake of decolonization, the political crises that have enveloped the post-colonial states, those political crises are very hard to disentangle with the categories of East versus West, of European versus indigenous. Because the ruling elites in these countries that have been embroiled in the crises 
in the economic elite, there is already by now across Africa, and certainly in countries like India, and absolutely in the Middle East, the economic elite is indigenous. It is not a European elite. The political governing elite in all these countries is almost exclusively indigenous. Categories such as, their, therefore, categories of East versus West, European versus non-European, will not be able to get you out of those crises. For the pressing problems of our day, the problems that come out of neoliberalism, the problems that come out of dictatorships, the problems that come out of the, the loot that transnational corporations are carrying out, for well, those pressing problems, it seems to me, if we want to continue the agenda of overturning the domination that comes with colonialism, if we are co committed to overturning the racial order that colonialism left behind, it's going to have to be a critique that brings back the aspirations and the frameworks that the national liberation movements and the ideologues of those national liberations put forward. I do not see any other way out of it. In the, the absence of that, what we end up getting is a revitalization of the kinds of nativisms and tribalisms that for, set, for the last 150 years have rent asunder the very countries that tried to liberate themselves from the colonial yoke. I'll stop there. Should I just go back here? Well, thank you. What a broad sweep uh, over hundreds of years, uh, multiple ideologies and struggles and the convergence uh, and a really interesting way of thinking about this, the, 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 the key struggles of the 20th century. Uh, as I said, we do have uh, time uh, till just maybe after seven for some questions and answers and comments. So uh, please raise your hands and we'll bring some roving microphones there over here. Is someone carrying the microphones around? Yeah, yeah you should come back, yeah? But I just want to see, have I got someone to, to take the microphones? Um, can I have a volunteer? I don't want to. Okay, right. So we'll start with the two on the side there. We'll take both those questions and I'll take one at the back and uh, one in the middle here, so we'll take those four and then give you a chance to talk. Um, thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Price. No, Prof, no, 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 Prof. I'm not sold, I'm so, I'm, no, 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 no. Can you please explain this to me? You go through basically three stages the so-called initial stage with um, nativism, um, saying that we know that our way is not the Western way, but our way is superior anyway. Um, and then there's a period where we all come together, Kumbaya, global north-south solidarity in terms of class. And then you're saying now that the current system is going back to the initial time. My question then becomes, are you telling me that there was a point in history and, and global history where the, the idea of the other, the idea of the West and the rest was irrelevant? So you're saying that during the 50s when people, the ANC and all these national movements across the world were fighting against capitalism and against colonialism, the idea of the West and the rest was not a thing. And also the second, which I, I think it's not true, by the way. Um, then the second thing is, you talk Wait, about... What's not, you, you see, you're saying that... I don't think that there was ever a point where the West and the rest was... No, that was implicit in your question. Oh, okay. I, I understood that. Okay, yeah. Um, then I also want to... S how, why do you um, put... The West, it seems to me that, to you, the West is a white face, right? So, um, the new ruling elites, simply because they are black, they are not ruling through the same um, Western matrix that was there before. What is it, structurally so, 
uh, that has changed um, post -colonial, uh, in the post-colonial world that makes a black leaders in this world no longer representatives of the West? Why do we need to have a white face for, for you to say that it's a perpetuation of Western domination? So to you, it's I just want to understand you. You're saying that even though uh, the faces might be black, it, they're still uh, perpetuating Western domination. Yes, That's so it's not necessarily because you say it's an internal domination. Yes, yes. I disagree. Right. It's still Western domination. Yes, I, I, simply I, I, right. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, I want to ask a slightly less long-winded question. Um, <laughs> firstly, um, I, feel like, I feel like you would have to explain what you understand by internal domination because it becomes very difficult to buy the point that, um, that there's a, a chasm that, that separates black and white suffering in some sense and that that needs to you know, because of a national bourgeoisie that looks exactly like we do, we should at some point deal with an internal type of domination. What we have in South Africa, unfortunately, is a very explicit case of settler colonialism, which happens in particular parts in the world, but it means that the settler population and the indigenous population now has to share the same territory. And a lot of, and, and I think if we, if, even if we take on class categories like from Dardani, Samir Amin, Frank, everybody in, in the dependency school from Latin America. Um, we could take up class categories and this wouldn't solve our problem or the problem that you've, you've highlighted. We could still see South Africa as an imperialist country with an internalized colony um, off which it feeds. And we could then still go, but the white worker does not, is not alienated in the same kind of way, does not have the same relationship to surplus value, is not exploited even. Uh, the exchange value for his, his commodity of labor power um, is, is almost much larger than its use value often, if that's, I know it's counterintuitive, but I think it's possible to think about it in that way. Mm. And so, and a lot of people in South African history and South African intellectual history have done a lot of work on the concept of negative surplus value, um, on the concept of a super exploitation of a black population. Anyway, the point is that we could take on these categories and we'll still not solve the problem that you're, that you're bringing up of a kind of humanism or whatever. For so us this is a non-long-winded question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting that one more point. <laughs> and, so, and so firstly, my issue is what is internal domination in, given that we have uh, an internal situation where there is a settler colonialist class that didn't just get your because, you know, they didn't just get here because like, oh, we went on holiday and we happened to end up in South Africa. It was a very particular process of the extraction of super uh, profits and so on and whatever. And these people still exist and they still take all the things they take. And then, okay, so the problem is white Marxism then in South Africa and all these peasants and for instance, the Communist Party in particular has had terrible um, consequences for people uh, in this country. At some point, I know with the League of African Rights, the black people were allowed into the Communist Party and then eventually they were like, no, there's too many black people and so on, whatever. But the point is, um, I don't think that using your categories saves us and I want to know how you think that might be possible. I understand. These are hard things to formulate and I, I, I don't begrudge you, you know, that, that you took some time in trying to do it, so I welcome that. But what I will do, um, Dr. Price, since both these were multi-part questions, if, if, I don't want to not, I don't want to fail in addressing them. So if I could address these, then we can, then we can move on. Uh, about the, the, the first question, you phrase it in a way that makes it impossible, of course, to say that you're wrong. Because, because what you said was, was there ever a time when the West was irrelevant to the struggles in the South? No, of course not. Irrelevant is a very strong word. But there was a time when in the political outlook of these anti-colonial movements, the enemy wasn't the West, but particular forces within the West, which also left open the possibility that you have allies and comrades also within the West. So what made the West a potential source of danger wasn't its geographical location, but who the people were coming out of that part of the world and what their interests were. And the flip side of that was, it was also no panacea to look to the non-West until you identified what the social forces were within the non-West and how their interests aligned 
with the forces seeking liberation. So you're, you're absolutely right that there was never a time when the West was irrelevant, but that's of course never been the point and not, not, was not the point of my talk. The whole point was to say that the idea of West versus East as being the linchpin, the axis on which you generate a political strategy is one that's going to be hard to make work. Now again you say, isn't it true, couldn't it be that the domestic elites are ruling through the West? Now, in Africa and other parts of the world, that even though they have dark skin, they still represent the West. Implicitly what that means is, isn't it the case that the framework which sees the West as being the problem is still a framework that we should adopt because black faces still are, you know, they still are black faces to the European power. No, I don't think it follows at all what you're saying. It's an empirical question and this is the point. Two things. First of all, it is utterly absurd to think that the Indian National Congress today in India is somehow the stool pigeon of the United States. It's never happened. The Indian ruling class is utterly and totally indigenously rooted and it sets its own agenda. There is not, there are places here and there where the World Bank or the IMF has exerted certain, some influence. But since 1947, the US has never been able to push India around, ever, on anything. It's an absolute uh, uh, error to think that it does. Secondly, even if there are instances, and there are many, where domestic ruling classes and political elites are very tightly tied in with Western interests, capitalist interests, transnational corporations, etc. They're very rarely puppets. They have their own agenda. Idi Amin had his own agenda. African ruling, that is the point. Because if they have their own agenda, it means then that you cannot simply s uh, shove them aside in looking at the West as your enemy. They are going to be linked up, even if you see the West as being the culprits. Papa Dog Duvalier was as close as you can get to a puppet of a Western power. He was never simply a puppet. Never happens. This is simply a unrealistic way of looking at how politics works. I'm sure I haven't convinced you, but at some point you will be. <laughs> if you get serious about politics, you will be. Or you end up somewhere in a prison. Now, about the internal domination that the, the second comrade raised, you're absolutely right, this is settler capitalism. Um, your, your question was not easy to, in, entirely to decipher. L let me take it step by step. Uh, you're saying that adopting class categories will not uh, be the solution. And I think what you meant to say was, look, th there is such an overwhelming predominance of a certain race in, the United, in South Africa that if you, uh, unless you attend to the specificities that come with that issue, you're not going to be able to address the specificities of South Africa. I think you're absolutely right. But the way to look at it, the question is not that adopting class categories will not be a panacea. The way to look at it is, Whatever solution and programs you adopt, if they do not involve a critique of the economic basis of rule in South Africa, you will not be able to even approach a solution. So it's one thing to say that class categories do not exhaustively solve your problem. I agree. It's quite another to say that we can set them aside. I would in fact invite both of you because you're obviously both very, very committed to emancipation. Think of any strategy which isn't simply uh, musical chairs, of keeping the structure intact but putting new faces in it. Come up with any strategy that will actually involve upliftment of the vast majority of black and brown people in this country that does not involve attacking capitalism. If you can do it, please call me. Because I hate being in this position of constantly being attacked from people who say, yeah, the Western stooge, this and that. Uh, so please let me know. I entirely agree class will not solve the problem. I, what, what I would say though is there's no solution to the problem without class. Thank you, Prof, for your lecture. But in Africa we have been witnessing a lot of brain drain where we have seen professionals from Africa going to the West and they feel like until I do something according to the Western standard, standards, I have not done yet. 
So my question is, do you believe our minds are still colonized? Do you believe like our minds are, are not yet free? Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. You use the word universal many, many times in your talk. And what we hear in the writings of decolonists, uh, especially in Africa and particularly in South Africa, are words like pluriversity and the replacement of scholars in the Western sense going back a thousand years with public intellectuals. You, you didn't touch on those to my satisfaction and I wish you would. Wonderful lecture, thanks very much. The great Scott Adam Smith and the great German Karl Marx and several other greats since then all agree you can't begin to understand society without class. Yes, of course. I want to push it there. What was the role of the Soviet Union's tanks in destroying Hitler? You've sort of glossed over a mountain. Are you kidding? Of course, I, I glossed over five million things. <laughs> yeah, but let's push this. You see, the, the Soviet Union built 110,000 tanks. The West built 88,000 tanks. Germany built 23,000 tanks. And those 110,000 tanks smashed their way all the way from Stalingrad to Berlin. And when they got there, the Germans said, these are the Asian hordes. This is, I'm picking up the Asian bit. That was crucial to the entire future. Can we gloss over it? Well, the answer is yes. And the reason is, it is the essence of a talk to gloss over everything that is not essential to the talk. So yes, we can gloss over it in this talk. Whether we can gloss over it in history, obviously not. But I'll come to that in a second. Let me start with a question about the brain drain and the the possibility, or at least the perception, that this crazy attention to Western standards and publishing in Western journals and reading only Western books, isn't it a sign that we're still colonized in some way? Yeah? I say yes. I think for a country like South Africa, for countries in the global south, unless there is a concerted effort to develop institutions which generate a sense of confidence and pride in your own culture, in your own intellectual achievements, in the achievements of your forefathers and the, uh, the centuries before, it's going to involve a continuing subordination to the power of imperialism and to the power today of neoliberalism. Now this might, to some of you who wish to caricature what I've said, this might seem odd, considering that I've just said for a long time that East versus West doesn't matter. The point here is not that it's the West that's doing the work, it's power centers. And I would say, if I were right now in a place like Mozambique, I would say you must not accept South African dominance. If I was in Sri Lanka, I would say you should not accept Indian dominance. This is not a question of East versus West. This is a question of students, of intellectuals in each country being rooted in the culture of that country because unless you are rooted in it, unless your institutions develop a sense of confidence and a sense of achievement in ordinary students working people who come to those universities, they do not develop the moral and intellectual resources to carry on struggles for social justice in their own countries. So my answer to you would be, yeah. And sadly, one of the aspects of neoliberalism in the past 20 years has been with the squeezing of funding to universities and the, the restriction on new employment and the turn to contract labor and the turning of jobs into little islands of privilege, increasingly the standards that are being used to justify not giving people jobs is making the, uh, the uh, requirements for tenure and promotion something you, you publish in Western journals. And the, for a period in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you saw all across the post-colonial world a concerted attempt to develop institutions, universities, colleges that it emphasized the creation of local journals, publishing in those journals, an attempt to retain intellectuals, retain academics, to build those institutions. That is no longer the case. I don't know if it's explicit, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but the brain drain that you speak of is one that is happening all around the world. The, the United States is acting like a suction pump 
that's taking intellectuals from all over the world and it's had a corrupting influence both on those intellectuals and back home as well. Now the second question about uh, the, the possibility or the relevance of universities more turning towards public intellectuals as being the, what, what you are promoting or the pluriversity, I don't know what pluriversity means, I don't, I don't want to know either. Uh, I'm sure it means something like in the realm of what we've been talking about. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, I, I see something wrong with the idea of a public intellectual, I don't know what it means. I, I think it means people who write op-eds quite a bit. And <laughs> there's nothing to be valued in that. It just means somebody who seeks out a space in dominant institutions and seeks out favor of people who control the means of communication. That, that doesn't help me because it's not, because even when Gramsci uses the term, it's not clear what, when Gramsci uses the term, he never uses the term public intellectual. He uses the term organic intellectual. And now that is a whole different, and I was coming to that I, without using the, that particular jargon because it's, it's, it turns people off and rightly so. The Marxist tradition is, has never been a tradition of emphasizing public intellectuals. What you should be is what I would call a committed intellectual. And what a committed intellectual does is, in some t there are some places where committed intellectuals publish op-eds. There are other times when developing your theory of how social justice works, how capitalism works, how, what political strategy is, sometimes it involves very arcane work. Sometimes it might involve highly mathematical economics. But if that's where it takes you, that's where you go. And the, further, the final dimension of being a committed intellectual is that sometimes you, just, you get a job in a university, but you spend all your time in trade unions. And you develop them. And that's your intellectual work. Being a committed intellectual has multiple dimensions. All of them converge around one thing, developing the theory, the science, and the practice of building the social forces that lead to human emancipation. I do not think that's captured in public intellectual. I do not think that's captured in being a social scientist. I think all of these are dimensions of a pluralistic uh, set of activities, let's, shall, shall we say. What I will say is, we should worry more about whether or not universities are accessible to ordinary people. <laughs> universities were always meant to be a place, at, in their best, in, the, in, the, in our spirit of what a university is. They weren't meant to be degree-churning institutions which throw you out onto the labor market. They're the last bastion in capitalism where you can actually develop your human capacities. Where there is a space for common respect, for engagement, with an exchange of views. And if, they, if these universities are not open to working people, if they're not open to the poor, if they become uh, gateways guarded by bankers and by loan officers, what the university becomes simply is a way of consolidating elite power. That's happening in South Africa right now. And as I look around this room, I think that elite power will have many different pigmentations. But it will be elite power. And it seems to me that a commitment to deepening our intellectual and our academic culture, if it is delinked from a even deeper commitment to opening these institutions to the poor, to a massive redistribution of resources, whatever their color happens to be, I think the university simply becomes another means of social control. The final point, I think the USSR, as, as it happens, played a very important role in overturning Hitler. I suspect your comment came because I said something a little bit snarky about the Soviet Union in the beginning of my talk, because I don't know how you got Hitler into this lecture, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, the, the, the Soviets played a very important... But, uh, you brought up an interesting point, which I'll very quickly bring up, Dr. Price, if I might. All across Asia in 1918, the Russian Revolution was seen as an Asian revolution. Uh, certainly, uh, talking straight, and it's actually wonderful to hear uh, in this environment. Um, it's really, really cold directly. in here. <laughs> yes. <it is. laughs> So I want to say thank you. You've spent, you're spending two weeks at the university, or two weeks in Cape Town, a lot of time at the university. Uh, we really appreciate the, your presence, the time you're giving us, and the debates and discussions that you're stimulating. Many of us are, are privileged to engage more directly than we can in a public lecture. And I would urge you, uh, members uh, of the audience, to continue to do so. And as a small token of our appreciation... A brown paper bag.
a souvenir from the University of Cape Town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Any refreshments?